Greetings and salutations, YouTubers and malfactors. We're back at StopLogic Motorsports with a bit of different content than my normal format. I've been receiving a lot of feedback since I posted content on the Orion Arcs B250 and the GPX FSE 250E, and I've been told, Hey StopLogic, you've owned slash ridden most of the bikes and a ton since you've been a kid. Well, how do these new Japanese dual sports stand up against these China bikes? And then I proceeded to pop over to the GPX page and watch as people regularly compare their bikes that sit in the $4,300 to $6,800 price range against KTMs, Betas, Huskies, etc. So I scratched my head and I think to myself, why not do a comparison of bikes in a similar price bracket than a bunch of comparisons of $12,000 bikes versus $5,000 bikes? So without further gilding the lily, we're going to dive in. So the first video of this series, I decided to pick the bike that got me back into riding and dirt racing, this venerable CRF250L, and by extension the CRF300L. So a bit of a history with me and the CRF250L dubbed Captain Slow One. I bought the bike back in 2015, put about 7,400 miles on it. I had the bike kitted out to the nines, 13 tooth front sprocket, 47 tooth rear, removed judder spring, full race tech suspension, rework and race ticker shock, EJK programmer, FMF, high flow foam filter, you know the works. Guards, whole nine yards. I spent about $5,400 out the door on the bike and then proceeded to blow about $2,200 on making it race worthy. Which once done, I did do a few TCCRA races on it and had some rides out at Rocky Ridge. It was a very competent bike. And when I ran it on the street, ran a 14 tooth, 42 tooth combo, and stock trim though, and a headwind, you couldn't use six gear because the bike didn't have enough juice on top. So why did I get rid of a bike that I poured so much time, money, and love into? Well, I had it on its kickstand, and the dirt was a little soft from a previous night's rain to hold its 318 pounds of pure unbridled fury, it tipped over. When I picked the bike up, the frame section by the peg had stress fractures and was bent inward. This is a well documented issue with the 250L and 300L. Just google it. I took the bike to the shop to see if the warranty would fix it and somehow my insurance got involved. And the bike was totaled. I ended up selling it on a salvage title as a significant loss after a frame repair. Fast forward to 2021 where Honda updated the CRF L to a 300cc package. While I was out testing my newish WR250R, a group of guys had the 300L out at spokes, which I totally recommend if you're in the Austin area, head out to and give it a try. It's a lot of fun. And they had this bike along with the KLX 300R from other buddies and a KLX 300. Like we spent a bit of time swapping bikes this day. And boy did the new updates look nice on the bike but I saw that same mild steel frame with the new added bonus of a one-piece subframe. We swapped bikes and I got to demo the 300L and all the shortcomings power-wise of the old bike were addressed. However, the stock suspension would still bottom on a cigarette butt. So let's look at the 300L stats. It has an MSRP of 5249, has a 286cc liquid-cooled four-stroke engine from the CBR300, with a slipper clutch and six-speed gearbox re-geared for woods use. Starting is handled through the magic button. So Honda claims the power rating of 28 horsepower, which give or take a little bit, but it's up from the 21 claim on the 250L, and boy can you feel it. It's fed through a uh, elect electronic fuel injection system, so no jets or carbs or finicky stuff to deal with. It has an approachable 34.7 inch seat height with a jaw-dropping 11.2 inches of ground clearance. I can exactly say that's jaw-dropping, but you know what I mean. It has a curb weight claim of 306 pounds, down from the 320 plus, it's like 328 if memory's running right, on the CRF250L, 2.1 gallons of gas on tap, and unadjustable show of suspension. We're going to touch on some of the oddities of this setup later. In the more red corner from the red corner, we have the two contenders from the land of China as our competitors today. The Orion 250 RXB and the GPX FSE 250E. 
The frame measurements and weights are also similar to the higher end models from GPX as they use the same suspension and frames in their models like the 300R, or the 450R, and the TSE 250R. Both of these Chinese offerings have similar stats with the Orion, using an overall slightly smaller frame that Orion kind of uses as a quasi mix from the FSE 250S. It is a very light handling bike, which you'll see in some of the earlier videos. One big advantage to these two bikes is they use Q345 steel instead of Q195 mild steel, which they both used to use, like the 250L. So you're going to be hard pressed to have one of these bikes totaled by tipping over in the dirt. Both of these bikes use an air-cooled 249cc engine, the starting also handled through Magic Button. Uh, GPX I believe has a 28mm carburetor, and the Orion has a 30mm Nibby Racing Carb. They have a stated seat height of 37 inches, 13 inches of sky-high ground clearance, a claim curb rate of 242 to 260 pounds, though some people have weighed them on the Facebook groups and it's closer to 280, so take take this with a grain of salt. We all remember bikes in the 90s that had the dry weight, so yeah, let's, let's be realistic here. A claimed horsepower of 19 to 20 horsepower, 2.5 gallons of gas on tap, and a 6-speed transmission. Specifically on the Orion, you have fully adjustable KKE suspension with the option $400 sent off to Joe Henry for custom valving and height modification. On the GPX, you have fully adjustable SCZ suspension based on the older KTM WP forks. Handguards come standard, dash plates included, all billet just about everything, so you have all the bling and the hubs and the pegs and the blah 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 blah, levers, yada yada. And the bike comes with a one point our 1 and 1 8 inch aluminum bar standard as opposed to a Brichis stainless steel bar that comes on nearly all Japanese dual sports that you just immediately want to tuck in, tuck in the bin. The price of the Orion RX V250L ranges from $26.49 plus give or take $400 in shipping and then the options from build it yourself at the base price to a fully customized bike, fully assembled, broken in, and tested is $37.17 plus tax. Well, that's a heck of a bargain for a bike that is getting kitted suspension, which we'll touch on later about, about that. For the GPX, their offering is $43.99 plus around $500 shipping and tax for a partially assembled bike that's shipped to you. If you want a comparison between these two bikes, hit up my other videos, which will appear in the top right hand corner periodically. I might even link them at the end so they're easier for you to find. Now you ask, why am I comparing two air-cooled four-strokes against a water-cooled Japanese dual sport? Well, really price and similar rider getting into the sport for the first time is what I estimate as the target audience of these bikes initially, being beginner friendly and having approachable power. And being a product of the 1990s, there's a few of you out there that remember when someone would take a CR80 uh, big wheel frame and stuff an XR200 in it and make a total woods weapon. Ah, uh, memories. So, okay, Mr. Smarty Pants, why would I want to buy a CRF300L? <coughs> the bike has an incredible aftermarket following from CRFsOnly.com. You can literally mortgage your house with all the hop-ups and farkles that you can add to a CRF. It's absolutely gross if you want to maintain any sort of fiscal responsibility. There's a robust dealership network, so if you are only mechanically capable of maybe changing out oil, that's a plus for the CRF. If you happen to be able to turn a wrench with a degree of competency, there are well-documented service manuals to do all of your own maintenance with. And also they offer a four-year extended warranty, which is pretty dang good, though likely on a CRF or a Honda product, you're not going to need it. Sorry about all that dog noise in the background, uh, someone is a little itchy. Oi, caboose! Give it a rest, man! The bike has a lower seat height and is less intimidating for a newer rider, and a very bottom-friendly engine. 
So when you're new to riding the woods, being able to put both feet down is a big plus to your confidence. Just from first-hand experience. And also, the updated version of the CRF300L, and this is a subjective measurement, it just looks so dang good. I mean, wow, they really did make this bike look modern and great. But to every light side, there is a dark side. So why wouldn't I want to buy a CRF300L? The frame is made of Brie cheese still. Imagine that if this is a thick area where the foot peg is, how easy that subframe is to bend made out of the same material when it's about one third as thick. So if you loop your bike, you might be looking at a totaled $5,400 paperweight. I learned tearing into the stock suspension on my 250L at a local shop, one fork does not have a spring. Yeah, you heard me right. There's no tinfoil hats or Alex Jones about to pop up and talk to you about chemicals in the water or chemtrails. This is first hand view. The left fork on mine was simply there for dampening. It had valves and shims and no spring, you just pushed all the way down. It was there simply for dampening. So when you redo the suspension, you end up springing both forks, reshimming and revalving. Also, the rear shock is simply dreadful if you plan to do any riding faster in second gear. Next, out the door you'll need to add some basic protection mods, which run about $300, and likely, likely the first change you're going to want to make is a uh, bash plate for the engine and changing out those Brie Cheese garbage steel bars. One thing that was touched on in the Yami Noob video is they scout the front seat for a lower height, and it can be uncomfortable on the ghoulies. If you're not aware of what ghoulies are, watch some Top Gear UK and you'll understand. Another thing about it is the slipper clutch, which is super nice for on-road riding. You won't end up uh, locking up your rear wheel, downshifting, or chirping, but off-road you'll find the jetter spring setup causes quick clutch fade when you ride spirited or if you do any mud riding where you're having to feather the clutch. You'll wind up going through a lot more clutch plates using a jetter spring setup because of this sheer differential amount. So objectively, it's a decent bike for 5500 bucks. And when I see, or when I use a bike as a measuring stick, the CRF 300L 250L is my 5 in a scale from 1 to 10. 5 being an ideal beginner bike and a fun platform for modding. But when it gets serious, you'll likely outgrow this bike. <clears throat> Unlike a WR250R and Yamaha Yamaha, why are you getting rid of all of your good stuff? Oh. Okay, Mr. Grumps McGur, now that you're done bashing my wonderful CRFL, why would I consider a Chinese bike? price is still significantly better for what you get. Imagine a fully kitted, gone through, broken in bike and suspension for 3800 bucks. So you take a CRFL, you toss on a full race tech rig, you're looking at another $1,300 on top of a $5,500 bike. Or if you go GPX route, the SCZ forks are easily on par with the KYB forks in feel and function from Yamaha. It's unusually plush. Secondly, you get a basic bike protection at a savings at around $300. You get the bash plate, you get the hand guards, on, you, know, you, get, you get some basic decent protection. Thirdly, both air bike, air-cooled bikes are fairly hard to kill, so you don't need to worry about tipping over and breaking a radiator, which without a radiator guard is a very real concern on all Japanese dual sports, especially the WR250R. If you go over the bikes with a fine tooth comb, either of these bikes can be taken out in the woods and raced or used for hardened to row in a spear divide, almost in stock trim. Which is kind of an impressive feat, but you won't necessarily outgrow these bikes as quickly. Also, both frames are made of sterner stuff, so a Q345 frame is closer to a KTM 690R frame material and the chrome alloy material, which explains the significant heft of these bikes a bit. You would really have to work to total one of these things tipping over. And if you haven't seen it, check out White Hollywood's channel. He's taking his bike to hell and back. I mean, I'm surprised we don't have a bunch of videos of him just throwing it off a cliff randomly with 
how much that bike's been beaten up and still comes back for more. <coughs> so invariably I'll receive this question. Do you represent these folks? No, no, not at all. I actually ride a WRC50R, but I'm in the process of spending more money on them than I could be comfortable with the race. I probably have a screw loose somewhere. I just want to give an objective review of what I consider similar to your products. So stay tuned for a KLX 300, 300R, and likely a DRZ 400 stack up. Well, Mr. Rompo Peel, you've tried to sell me on these here Chinese bikes, what's the catch? Well, good thing you ask. There's no such thing as a free lunch in life, doubly so with dirt bikes. There is likely not a dealer network or mechanics who will work on your bike locally. If you cannot turn a wrench, you will discover ages of frustrations trying to troubleshoot your bike and Facebook groups. Just don't be that guy who asks for help and then doesn't listen to any advice from people that have a lot more experience. Nudge. There are some parts that cross-reference the brands as they share a spirited reproduction, in air quotes, of, but they're not aftermarket supported, so to speak, for those bikes. There's not a ChinaBikesOnly.com out there to part you from your hard-earned wallet weight. There are sparse or no service manuals. Get the hint. Whoever's the first one to have a good service manual will be first in the market for improving everyone's quality of life. You know, nudge. Either one of you guys, Orion, GXP. Come on. So when you need to adjust your valves or do any sort of timing chain replacement, a lot of your guidance will be trial and error, or hoping somebody relatively educated answers your Facebook post. As a previous EETC certified um, mechanic on bikes, not having a book with all my torque values handy as I turn into a bike fills me with a sense of dread. If your model gets discontinued, future parts will wind up being difficult to find on these bikes. I can still find all of my OEM for a WR two years after it being discontinued, but finding parts for an older Pitster Pro, that can actually prove to be a bit of a challenge. Also, lastly, some states will give you an ulcer the size of a basketball trying to plate these bikes as they are not 50 state compliant. I'm looking at you, New York and the People's Republic of California. So what are my overall thoughts? Picking a bike for recreation or racing is a daunting thing. Dropping 5k on a hobby is a big decision. My best advice coming from a guy who used to Craigslist clapped out bikes and restore them and flip them is really to understand your limitations, not only as a rider but as a mechanic. You do need to understand that any bike you will have has to be maintained, and if you can't handle that, likely you should go with an established brand. Or you can roll the dice and learn how to fish and feed yourself, so to speak, and save thousands of dollars in the long run learning how to wrench on your own bike. Yeah, maintenance changes between models, but there's some fundamentals you learn working on your own bike that'll help you for a lifetime. Well, hopefully, this has proven helpful of what direction you want to take. I'll be stacking up the Kawasaki and Suzuki offerings in my next few videos. And if you have a bike that I should go out and try, maybe add to the list, feel free to reach out to me. As always, if you like the content, like and subscribe. If you don't, feel free to criticize me harshly. You can whip me, beat me, and make me write hot checks. And hopefully I'll see you on the next one. Have a great day.